thanks for joining me. This is a, an activity that I've never done before, which is to talk about the answers in a new way. And in preparation for tonight, I, I have actually been reading it for the first time, which is kind of pretty interesting. When I was channeling it, I would, of course, review each day, but I never once read the book all the way through. So here it is, you know, 15 years later, and I'm actually picking it up and reading it like a book. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to see. First of all, I don't have any connection whatsoever. I don't feel any connection as having authored it. But it's a novel experience to see that it feels like the content um, could be written 15 days ago instead of 15 years ago. Uh, and that, that was pretty fascinating to, to, to me, definitely. But I'm going to start out by, there's a lot of people here that aren't familiar with the story. Um, I've sold the book for, you know, 13 years. And a lot of people in the beginning, when I started to come out with my story, you know, they're very, very familiar with how the book came to be. But there are a lot of other people that aren't familiar with it. So I want to give everyone a little bit of a background just to make sure we're all on the same page and understand the process. And it, I'll even go back a little farther than that, just by reminding people that the first time I ever had an experience knowing something not through earthly means was on 9-11-2001. And that was the day when I became aware that our consciousness is not connected to our bodies because I experienced what was happening at the World Trade Center while I was an hour away. Uh, but slowly, I started to be able to get more information from non-physical sources to the point that I became curious about how to not just to receive, but I wanted to figure out a way that I could be more conversant with souls that don't have bodies. And so I began the journey in uh, 2005, figuring out how to connect and how to communicate and how to listen and how to be heard and how to have questions answered. And the result of that process was that I learned what channeling was, which I didn't even know. And I learned how to accept the words in this book, to hear them. I learned how to not interject my own um, point of view or personality. I learned how to try very hard to keep myself out of it. And by very hard, I mean, I practiced a lot before I actually got this book. Um, and I, I found it really interesting that when I was looking through this, that the timeline of it is that the first channeled piece was on May 27th, 2005. Until I picked up the book, I actually thought it was sooner. And here's, here's why. I'll tell you why. When I decided to be more conversant with souls that are not physical, I started activities to learn how to communicate or to hear. And I started those activities on um, February 2nd, 2005. And that's, uh, it's a significant date. So I'm just going to jot it down. So I started on, on February 2nd, 2005. I started these exercises to learn how to hear guides at will without waiting for to be struck by lightning and to get things and images and words in my head, but to be able to be a participant in it. And on that very first night, I might've been perched on an edge for a long time because I was able to connect on that very first night with a soul that wasn't inhabiting a body in, in a way in which I could ask questions and get answers, answers that, they had that Google thing back then in 2005, answers that I could Google the questions and the answers to find out whether or not the information that I was getting was valid. 
And so even on the very first night, I had some success in connecting with verifiable information, proving that I was tapping into uh, facts that could be known on earth, but that I didn't have any personal exposure to. One thing that was critical coming from the background that I came from, which was, which was far more about academics than it was about anything spiritual at all, it was very, very important to me to take as much of an intelligent or scientific approach to everything that I did. Because if I didn't feel validation, uh, I didn't want to participate. I didn't want to be a fraud. I didn't want to come across with information that could be uh, not helpful. And so my participation has always been that if I'm going to do anything with guides and bring it forth, I want to bring forth information that can really benefit people and as many people as possible. So the fact that I started on February 2nd and the first channeled series of pages was on May 27th, that was a surprise to me because right off the bat, once I became conversant with guides, uh, they started having me sit down at the computer and type and auto write uh, almost every day and almost every day for two hours. And I thought before I started getting ready for tonight, I thought that I was channeling the book in March, I really thought that it started right away because I was working so hard. I can't believe I was channeling for two hours a day for that long and I wasn't even producing anything because that's a lot of effort and a lot of time that I was putting in. And ha however, it gives me some comfort to know that I pulled up notes from February through the end of May and wow, was there a learning curve. Uh, there was a tremendous learning curve. So luckily I was excited and passionate enough about what I was getting that I stuck with it. And, and there were pitfalls and there were ups and downs and there were days where I felt completely uh, disconnected. There were days when I felt absolutely shattered and there were days when I was in the flow and felt like, oh yeah, this is easy and I can do this every day of my life. Uh, and I'm sure each of you who are with us today have had similar experiences with your own intuition where you're in the flow and you're connected or you feel disconnected and, you, and you're more in your own ego. So you're questioning things, you're not in the flow, you're doubting things, um, feelings from your whole life that are uncomfortable start to emerge, whether it's competitiveness or loneliness or scarcity or lack or mistrust or something. But then you get back into that intuitive flow again and everything starts to come with ease and with flow. Uh, so throughout the whole period of the beginning of February until I actually did start to get passages for the book, I learned to distinguish between being connected and the, and distinguish between my voice and another soul's voice. And that was imperative because I didn't want to write a book. I didn't have an agenda and I didn't know what the book would say. So the best thing I could do was to keep practicing and learning how to get myself out of the way. Therefore I could be a conduit to bring through whatever came through. So I'm going to start out with, uh, telling a lot of people have copies of the book that they, but they don't necessarily have the original book. And let me put this on a view where I can see everyone. If you have the original purple color book with you, um, hold it up if you have it. Hold it up to the camera if you have it. I, I know Nelly has it. But who else might have it? Oh, Anne, you have a copy right there with you. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's, that's pretty rare. Oh, Gina, you have it. Okay. Um, I don't even think I have a copy of it anymore, but the original release uh, is, it, it's not the same one that we're using today. And the reason is that I put the book out there with a lot of trust 
in the process. I was so blown away by what I had received in here and so optimistic. Oh, there's Teresa. You have it. Oh, wow. Look at that. And Laura. Oh, how funny. Wow. And Patty. Oh, I didn't even know there were that many still in existence. That's so funny. Wow. Very interesting. Can we see it? Yeah. Can we see it? Can someone hold it up and unmute themselves? And I think we, oh, Laura, yours has a good view. And yours has a good view. Yeah. Can you see that? Oh, Nellie, we can see yours really well, too. Yes, yes, that's really funny. That's so funny. I haven't seen that in a really long time. Oh, and I signed it, Laura. Huh? <laughs> Harry's must be signed too. <laughs> oh, yours is signed. Cool. Oh, that's 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 old. <laughs> you just dated yourselves. <laughs> wow, wow, that looks pretty battered, Laura. <laughs> that's funny. Very interesting. Uh, but so. It, with the original release of the book, I had this faith in humanity that I could go out there and start talking about what soul I was channeling and what the experience was like, and I would just trust in the whole process. But shortly after I started, I, I began to recognize that when I was in public and I was giving seminars and things like that, I wasn't comfortable telling people where I got the book from, uh, because what it would do is it would distract people from the content, because they would automatically go from perhaps the openness of the flow of the right brain. And then as soon as I said, what soul is not in her body anymore, I was communicating with all of a sudden that right brain would shut down and they'd go over to the left and the left would say, that can't be possible. We want evidence. That doesn't sound like her tone. She never used that word. So what it did was it made us focus on something other than the point. And the point was the content. So what I did was a few years later, I released the book again. I didn't change anything other than taking the name of the original primary author out of it. Um, and I, and she and I together made up a, a fake name for her and we re-released it basically saying that we weren't going to put her identity in there. Uh, so for anyone that has the copy that has the, the blue door, your copy probably does not say the original soul that I communicated with um, the name. Now, before I even talk about that, for those of you who have any curiosity, when, when we die, we don't really retain our name. We don't really retain our identity. We don't retain even our, our gender. In the energy realm, we're fully mature, spiritually complete, whole, loving souls. So all the tags and all the self-identification that we develop during a physical life, it it becomes a part of us. We embody the experiences and we live in, in trust with all of those experiences and we never forget them. But any one physical life is not the whole of our self-identification, nor are we young nor old, or uh, do we have a religion? Do we have a gender? Do we have preferences? Do we have anything like that? So even when I refer to the souls over the next three sessions that we have together, what I'm referring to is their last known incarnation, um, their last incarnation when they were well known and who they were known as during that incarnation. So for all I know, they could be here again. Um, they could have been around us myriad times through myriad lifetimes, but I'm specifically referring to how they reference themselves and their earthly identification when they were giving me the pages and the passages in this book. So understanding that I will refer to them as the names that they were known as on earth, but it's always important to remember that this is one part of their soul. This is one part of their eternal experience. 
This is only one aspect of them, just as each of you is only one aspect of your whole self and only one aspect of who you are becoming and who you are. So you are tagged with a name. You are Debbie or Sue or Gay or Jeannie. And now you're looking through the lens of that perception, but it's not at all the whole of you. You're broader than that. If you're female now, you've been male plenty of times. If you're gay, you've been straight. If you're straight, you've been bi. If you're bi, you've been gay. We've all had different opportunities to experience different facets of the whole of us. So none of us are limited to just the experiences of this incarnation. Now, again, when I'm communicating with any soul over the next three sessions regarding the content here, I will refer to them as we may know them. And sometimes as I was going through and reading which passages came from which souls, there is some interesting links or some feeling of, well, that makes sense that that particular soul would kind of want to continue a topic or address something that they may not have addressed while they were in their bodies, okay? But overall, the bulk of this material was channeled or, or spoken to me through the soul of, of, a lot of you know it, you could type it in the chat room if you want, see who types the fastest. But many of you know the answer of where the bulk of this information came from. And the soul was, is um, Ayn Rand. Now, when Ayn started to communicate through me, that's right, Patty. Um, when I started to communicate through me, I, I didn't have a particular predilection toward her. I, I wouldn't say that I was a fan. I wouldn't say that I was not a fan. Uh, she was just somebody that I had come across who had a body of work. I was a little familiar with it, but not in depth. And um, I read a book or two when I was in my young 20s, and I remember the books, but I remember that uh, one book in particular, even though I thought it was very intelligent and very well written, uh, you know, it left me with kind of a bad taste in my mouth, so I wasn't going to run out and buy the sequel. So it's important to understand that one of the ways for you even to authenticate the conversations or connections that you have with the non-physical is sometimes it's very validating to connect and connect with souls that you don't necessarily have an affinity for because it gives you a sense that you're not making this stuff up. It's not like you chose your favorite from history. You know, if I were going to choose my favorite from history, at the time in 2005, I, I would have just like, and you can't even think of it as history because you're going to laugh at me, but I probably would have picked like Bill Bixby. You know, that would have been my hero, right? So that's who I would have chatted it up with. But, you know, Bill still to this day have, hasn't really chatted it up with me at all, but that's validating. So it's not about my preferences. It's about what is going on? How are we connected? What is our journey? What is our path? What is the path of other souls that are not connected to physical bodies at all? Um, I want to give you a, just a little bit of really brief insight into Ayn in her most previous known life, because it does help to understand the context of the book a little bit more. Uh, she, had, she was born in Russia, and she eventually... Uh, made her life in the United States. She was an intellectual. Uh, she became renowned for her philosophy, and her philosophy became so popular that it was even dubbed a specific term. Uh, the way that she spoke of her philosophy, and it, it was, it's been termed objectivism, the way that she discussed objectivism was primarily through fiction novels, and she would create 
uh, a, a cast of characters to depict what objectivism looked like in the absence of it or in the presence of it. And so her, her, her whole entire um, purpose that she felt was to educate people to almost give um, a cry out to help people understand that if they give away their power to the government or they give away their power toward mediocrity, that the world would eventually crumble. So even to today, there are, there are plenty of um, people who follow objectivism, who practice it, who study the philosophies of Ayn Rand and her body of work. There are societies, there are societies out there that are sanctioned by the estate of Ayn Rand. And then there were plenty of um, followers or fans or enthusiasts that are not necessarily sanctioned, but they so believe in the material and, and what they believe to be wisdom that she brought through, that they are interested in propagating it and making sure that it perpetuates long after her lifetime. But one of the uh, interesting things is if we were to line up a thousand humans and then they leave their bodies and we say, which one is the most likely to uh, give earthlings a, a story or a book that will help us advance in our ability to connect through the vibration of love, she'd probably be the last out of that 1,000. Because in her body of work, she, wasn't, she didn't demonstrate a lot of patience. She didn't demonstrate a lot of charity. She didn't demonstrate a lot of inclusivity. She had her premise as being that it, in, it's very, very important that we are self-reliant and that one of the paths to happiness is, is hard work. Um, participating in your own journey through your own effort, and then you receive the reward of your own effort. And uh, to me, that body of work, I thought it was fascinating and liberating and definitely intellectually stimulating to me, but it certainly didn't make the groundwork for us to maybe understand spirituality in the way that it's been really opening up over the last 50 years or 20 years, or 10 years, or five years, or three months. So you wouldn't necessarily say that her primary teachings were um, teaching the entirety of what we consider to be spiritual enlightenment, which would encompass a lot more of understanding how we project consciousness into reality, how we all are one, how something that happens in the United States affects China and how something that happens in China affects the United States, that we're not, in, in, we're not individually oriented to the point of isolation. And her premise was more about the rights and the power of the individual with very little focus on what does it mean to be interconnected with all. So I was communicating with her and rapidly, very, very rapidly getting information and validation to prove her identity. Because to me, if I didn't know her identity beyond a shadow of a doubt, I wasn't going to continue. It didn't feel right to me. So during those first three months, we got to, I got to know her. According to her, I already knew her and I was remembering her. Uh, she already knew me and she was making me remember her. Uh, but I was curious as to why she would have an interest in the process of the human experience to the level that she did now, uh, since I think her philosophy of objectivism really stood as a firm body on its own, a complete body of work. And what she explained to me early on, and those of you who remember from the book, there are three purposes for life. One is to love, to create, and to learn. In that order, there are no exceptions. So she can look at her life as Ayn Rand and say, I did a great job with helping people to create 
and I did a great job with helping people to learn. But I just kind of like skipped over the love thing. So as a soul without a body, she was able to put that into perspective and see that the completeness wasn't really finished because she left out one of the most important aspects of helping people to discover if humanity is to advance on a spiritual path and therefore on each other path that they can advance on, it's important that we remember that love is the most important vibration or the most important energy in all of existence. So one of the reasons that she fielded me for this, and then they, they, meaning her and other guides, trained me to learn how to channel or auto-write, was because they fundamentally understood that my life, my body of history in this physical life, and the way that I communicate and the way, I guess, even that my brain operates, that I could be a candidate for her to complete what she considered an incomplete body of work while she was physical. So she wanted to really add in the component of love to her work. Now, one of the things I find interesting about the timing of giving this particular focused class of Inside the Answers is um, our period of uh, separation or isolation um, with this virus, it's kind of exaggerated, um, exacerbated some of what doesn't work well on the planet. Those things have become more visible. What's not working has become more visible. And the, the consequence of that is that we can see that the fiction books that Ayn had written in a predictive nature of what could happen to humanity, that a lot of that is actually coming true. And it actually does exist today, even though she wrote those books. I guess uh, I probably should have looked it up, but... I'm sure someone can type it in, but 50, 60, 70 years ago, I don't remember the exact dates of when the books were authored. Uh, but it's interesting that means that if her, if her novels had a predictive element to them that resonated and ring true about the way that uh, things are unfolding for humanity, then that means that there was an aspect of her when she did write her stories there was an aspect of her that was uh, intuitive. There was a part of her that was also channeling to be that accurate to have what is apparently precognitive themes woven into her fiction stories. But her perspective and her physical, she started to write in the 1930s. Thank you, Nellie. Um, so her, her, her journey in being predictive, she was able to um, channel or intuit or be inspired by some themes, but her body of history as Ayn Rand and what she endured, which was not a terribly easy life by any means, it restricted her from opening up the channel that brought in the other part, the love part of the to love, to create, and to learn. Uh, so it makes us have some curiosity to go back and look at her fiction novels and almost become witness to the inspiration and the channeling that took place in them. It also helps us to recognize that um, work, works on earth, whether it's art or literature or music, when they have the ability to outlive the author or composer or creator, they do have an element of um, connection in it. There is an element, call it inspiration or intuition or channeling or co-creating or being a conduit, but there is an element of universal and eternal wisdom or information in those pieces. So that's kind of fascinating to see that we could pick up 
a, a book that had been authored by Ein, and it's not going to feel necessarily dated. Maybe the furnishings and the clothing will, you know, definitely be a timepiece, but the content and the delivery of her philosophy, it, it's, it is timeless. And she um, was able to transcend any particular trend or any trendy way of communicating an idea. That's evidence also of someone really being connected beyond just their own physical individual space. Um, all right, so Ayn is not a likely soul. And I began to realize more and more that since she was still so wildly popular on earth and she is, if I were to be out there now doing what it is, which is you know, always wanting to bring information of value to as many people as I can, uh, not only did I not want clients and audiences to be distracted by her identity or her physical earth life, but I really didn't want to call attention to needing to debate this with real enthusiasts that might have nothing um, to do with wanting to journey into their own spiritual development or understanding eternal wisdom in the ways that I think everybody who's participating here today is wanting to do. And that's why her name doesn't appear. But she did channel through me the bulk of the book. Um, the next thing that I want to point out is after channeling um, the book for uh, 2005, I, uh, throughout the whole summer, uh, at the end of the summer, yeah, you've got to remember that this was all new to me. It was surreal to me. I had no exposure whatsoever to anything of this sort. So at the end of the summer, after channeling for a few months, I, I just decided that if I didn't know what to do with the material, I was just going to stop. So I stopped, and I stopped, I believe, if I remember correctly, um, I think I stopped. Um, it was definitely at the end of the summer, if I can remember correctly. Let me see. I'll find the date. I can see. Yeah, it was. It was September. Yep, September. That's funny. Um, so I stopped in September of 2005 after very diligently receiving passages at least um, several times a week from the end of May through mid-September. And when I stopped, I wanted, to, I wanted to start to put the pieces together of me and my physical life, the concept of channeling a book, which wasn't widely accepted on earth at all at that time, and how I could partner both of these together to be able to be of, you know, maybe positive influence to others. What could I do? Could I get it published? Was there an audience? Was there a demand? Would people believe it? Would people um, be able to extract information in that book that they could put to good use? So I just stopped and then I decided to um, surrender, I guess would be the way to say it. And that's a compliment to me because I really wasn't surrendering. I had a little bit of um, an angry energy in me at that time because I felt like they were asking something of me, but I didn't have any of the earthly means to do what it was I was being asked to do. They didn't really tell me, make sure you get this in front of a million people. They didn't tell me to get in front of 30. But because of the power of the words I had been listening to and digesting and living for those months, I felt a sense of responsibility to make sure that this did something more than sit in my computer, but I didn't have the means to do it. So I, I stubbornly took a break. That's why I laugh when I say I surrendered because I didn't surrender. I stubbornly uh, took a break. I stopped um, on September 19th, 2005 and started again on July 3rd, 2006. Wow, that was a bit of a stubborn break, wasn't it? <laughs> 
wow, I didn't realize I was that stubborn. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not that stubborn anymore. But I took a, quite a stubborn um, surrendering break. And I, um, I just went ar- about life. Before channeling that much of the answers, that much of the manuscript, I had written a book um, with a co-author, and she's on, on the call tonight, Jeannie. And I had written it like a human does. It, it was a lot of research. It was a lot of working. It was a lot of drafts. It was a lot of not being able to put a cohesive sentence together. It was a lot of frustration. It was a lot of wins when you got that, that magic paragraph or you interviewed that person that was just right for the concept or illustrating it. Uh, the process took four years until it was published by a publishing company. So it's not that I... I wasn't familiar with the process of what it takes to get a book out there, but having been through it for four years and putting a book together and watching it go through edit after edit and proofreading and edit and still finding mistakes and still cutting out words and still, you know, working to get a publishing company. I, I understood all of that and I didn't want to begin the process again unless I understood how this might go. So here guys are tantalizing me with information that was oftentimes just leaving me breathless. But the only thing I felt at the time that could really tantalize me and really take my breath away is to tell me how to get it the hell out there. And until they could do that, I wasn't going to participate anymore. Wow, that sounds like surrender. Sounds very peaceful, right? Very peaceful. So I stopped. Um, And I had some interesting experiences in that time. I had, let's call them like near misses, where it seemed as though someone would step into my path that was interested or someone connected with a publishing company that had uh, maybe just a uh, part of that publishing company where they did focus on what they would consider to be inspirational or spiritual or ethereal pieces of work. But none of them panned out. It almost felt as if guides had enough evidence and stepping stones to keep me feeling passionately connected to possibility while I sorted out my own human experience with what was to become of this. And ultimately, uh, during that period, it was a little bit of a, um, uh, what's the word? I know there's a term. Um, the term when you go on a magical adventure. So what I did do in parallel of that waiting period was I went on a magical adventure with other guides. I, I used that period to find credible information. I went on scavenger hunts with them. I made them prove over and over and over again, beyond a shadow of a doubt that they were the souls that they claimed to be. I learned and I grew. I learned how to even personally apply the information in a magical mystery tour. Yeah, that's it. So, uh, and the word that pops into my mind is like kaleidoscope because that was a very trippy year. Definitely a trippy year. That year, if we were to make a movie out of that year, uh, you guys would be like, no, that's, that's great fiction, but there's no way that it could be true. It was a very trippy year. The places we wound up, the people I met, the validation and the proof, the hard evidence coming from um, sources that you could never imagine or believe. It was a very, very trippy year. But that trippy year uh, brought me full circle to at least have undeniable faith in the experience of channeling the answers, the value of it. And it helped me to soften my feeling of responsibility of what was to become of the book. And it helped helped me to soften my sense that I had um, a big responsibility that I was carrying the world on my shoulders the way that Atlas was carrying the world on his shoulders, right? So I, I felt that responsibility lift and I became more enlightened personally. I kind of sorted out a lot of my own troubled childhood, um, a lot of painful experiences that I worked through. 
and came to peace with, I'm going to self-publish this book and wherever it lands is okay. And I have trust that it will go near and wide and far and close and it'll land exactly where people are ready for the value of the material. So the, when I did return to it in um, July of 2006, uh, the bulk of what came through after that, which was pretty short, it was more of a tie-in or making the book more of value to people because it gave us an exercise. It gave us a way to implement that which it is we had experienced in the book. That did not have any authorship other than Ein. But prior to that, from May of 2005 through September of 2005, what would happen during my channeling was during each session, I would sit at the computer with two uninterrupted hours in front of me. In most cases, a day's passage would come from that two hour session. As you can see, they're dated and they're typically anywhere from two to four pages. That was the byproduct of those two hours that I would spend. Um, and I had three kids. So, you know, it was a matter of shuffling to make sure that at least five times a week, I had two hours where I could be uninterrupted and I could get into that flow. Um, and during it, as, as all of this was coming through, I have somebody asking a question here. Okay, someone's asking me what happened on my trippy year. <laughs> I, I was actually thinking about, I still think about putting it in writing now because the world is so much more evolved now than it was 15 years ago. And I think that putting the story out there would actually help to give people a sense of the magic of life and how, um, how much the universe and our guides and the non-physical partner with us to help us with that which it is we are positively focused on. So the story now in hindsight, without feeling the need to validate any of it or prove any of it, because I don't feel the need to validate or prove any of it, now I think the story could at least be some fun for us. And it can also help us to witness the miracles in our own lives and how they unfold and to let go of the resistance when wonderful and good things are coming our way. So um, thank you for your question. It is a, it is a movie. Man, is it a movie. Uh, thank you for your question. And I, I am considering even going through my notes and writing some of this out because there is great value in it in hindsight now. I would have had too much skepticism, I believe, 15 years ago. And like I said, I don't really feel the need to prove anything to anybody. But now I think it could be a really wonderful and liberating and fun and magical experience for us to look at all of the incredible ways that non-physical sources helped me to make the discoveries that I've made. It goes way beyond signs. It is, it is miracles. It is absolutely miracles. Right, Jeannie? Yeah, she'd have to help me remember all the details too. Uh, so I will look into that. Uh, so now, in the meantime, what happened was during each of my two-hour sessions, I still, as a human being, I still was removing masks and layers. So I would sit down and I would, I had a, a, I had a tutor, a soul. She went by the name of Pat. She was my channeling tutor, my uh, auto writing tutor. And uh, from the period of when I started to communicate with guides through the first channeled passage, I worked with her hard every single day. And how do you work with a channeling tutor who is not physical? That sounds kind of interesting, right? But let me tell you how it worked. So what would happen was, so I would sit down at the computer for two hours with my hands on the keyboards, right? And every day for two hours, I would wait and I would listen. And every time I heard something, I would type it out. And if I didn't hear anything, I wouldn't type. What it trained me to do was to become clear between 
between my own voice and the voice of another soul. Okay. And one of the, she would, Pat would play a lot of, lot of, lot of tricks on me. And that's how I got trained quickly so that they, the guides would feel comfortable that I was ready to get the passages in a way that could be useful to us and not insert my own whatever dysfunction I was still holding on to from my physical journey. But some of the tricks that she would play on me, the hardest one, I look back on it now and I laugh that I thought it was so hard. But oftentimes when I would least expect it, um, Pat would be in the middle of something, telling me something and I'd be flowing and I'd feel good and I'd be typing it all out. And then all of a sudden she would go silent and I wouldn't hear anything. With the number of times that happened, you can't believe how many times I fell to pieces. I fell to pieces. She was silent, but I was like, oh my God, I can't hear. I, I, I never was able to do this. This is stupid. This is my imagination. I can't channel. This is crap. I don't want to do this. I want to get up. And I would fall to pieces. I went from A to Z or Z to A or stop to go or red to green. I, I did this on a dime. And I would... I would get panicky and I, then I, I would, if, I, if it lasted more than 18 seconds, I would probably start to cry. Um, and I remember the longest period that she went without speaking was 22 minutes, all right? Now, I was still pretty insecure about the whole process or what the meaning was. By the end of the 22 minutes, I think I had like trashed my entire life. That's how bad I felt after this interminable 22 minutes, you know? And then all of a sudden, I'm like, you know, I'm crying. This sucks. I wasted my time. You suck. Everything sucks. At, at 22 minutes, I'm, I'm a total mess, right? Thank God I didn't wear mascara while I was channeling, or the guys would have just been laughing hysterically as it was all over my face and my body. But at the end of 22 minutes, Pat came in and finished the sentence that she had been in the middle of saying 22 minutes earlier. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, we're good. Let's keep going. All right, this is going to be a great book. Oh, yeah, I understand. This is really great. So I was in this, like, polarized place as she was training me. I was high. I was low. I was high. I was low. And it, it's fascinating because it actually is a metaphor for life. When we are connected, we are high. When we're disconnected and we're living in our own head and we're living in ego or we're living in, in judgment or an unrealistic version of what we might be experiencing in our real life, we get miserable, right? We get miserable. That's exactly what it is that we do. But what Pat was able to teach me with the tricks that she played, and she played a lot of them on me was that I was in fact channeling because there is no way on earth I would have stopped writing if I were writing and then not continued a sentence for 22 minutes while I went through all this nutty stuff of, of, of believing that everything was fake and false and useless and horrible. That's not something a person would ever do to themselves, especially when they were completely unfamiliar with the idea of channeling to begin with. So that and other tricks were very, very helpful. And when she started to see that I had confidence in my ability to hear her voice versus my voice, she also, they developed confidence in the fact that when I couldn't hear her, it meant she wasn't speaking, but I didn't go in a rush to try to fill in the words with my own thoughts. And for souls without a body who are not encumbered by human limitations, it was important to them that I not encumber the book with my own perspectives without being clear. So that was an important thing for them to see was that I wasn't filling the words in with my own words. And it's, it's so easy to see that the, the ego would want to fill that space in because that space is scary and it makes us feel, if we're auto writing, it can make us feel unworthy or it can make us feel insignificant if we're not channeling anymore. So just filling it in makes us feel a little bit more confident or a little bit more okay that day. 
Um, so after that period, that's when I came in and she just started to download the book. Oftentimes passages would come at me so fast and furious that I couldn't even keep my hands on the keyboards as fast as the material coming through me. But each day's passage, no matter when it began, it always started out with a write up, a warm up period writing about me or my life or that day, or they would just rattle off insignificant or unrelated words so that they knew where I was and my ability to move from being Karen to being a conduit. Um, what I did in preparation for today, as you can't see, but I have another computer over here, and I pulled up all of the original writings, all of the warm up, all of the personal information that guides gave me while we were getting ready. Uh, and, I, and I did start to read through it and remember what the experiences were like. And they were, they were profound. Uh, but one thing that was really interesting for me that I hadn't expected was on one particular day, I had gotten very, very used to the voice of Ayn Rand. Um, one day I was typing the passage of the day and I went, I went offline. I usually didn't like have a little side conversation with guides unless they had a side conversation with me. And on that particular day, um, I went off to the side and I'm like, who is this? Because this is not I. By that point, I'd already come to understand the vibration of a soul. I'd come to ex understand... Um, It's so hard to describe the individuality of a soul when they're communicating. It's not the sound of a voice. It's not the tone. It's a vibration. And ultimately I could tell maybe not what soul I was connecting with if it weren't Ayn or Pat, but eventually I could tell that it wasn't one of them. And so that particular day I, I did say, who is this? I just figured it was, you know, maybe someone, them, one of them, you know, a, a, an old family friend or someone I had communicated with that I had known uh, in my own earth life that I had talked with. And what, what I was told was that it wasn't, it was another soul that had been well known in his previous life. And it was fascinating because as soon as I got validation that I was connecting with a different soul, um, it came with the knowledge instantaneously of who that soul was. Hold on. I'm trying to open up a flap here. Okay, it's upside down. That's why I couldn't read it. All right, so the very first soul that came in, other than Ayn Rand, happened to be, anyone want to put a guess in, in the chat room? I'll give you a little bit of a hint. In the beginning of the book, I had written in my, in my thanks, or my acknowledgement page, on the acknowledgement page, there's a thanks to certain initials. I only put initials in, I didn't put whole names in. And I didn't put whole names in because this was the souls that came in to guest passage uh, certain pieces in the book. And the last thing I wanted to do at this point was say, oh, I channeled the book from Ayn Rand. And then we had, oh, we had Thomas Edison come in and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Because once again, you stop paying attention to the content and you only pay attention to, is this true? Is this valid? Is this real? So instead, for my love of the experience, I thought it would be, uh, Patty, oh, uh, Christina, yeah, good, good guesses. So for my own personal experience, I, I um, for my own personal reason, oh, yeah, Lennon and Harrison and, and Franklin, yeah. So I, I didn't, I wanted to honor them, which is why I put a heartfelt thanks into 
the acknowledgement page, but only with their initials and not their names. So the very first one that came in and surprised me for the Mama cast, the very first one that came in and surprised me was actually Thomas Edison. And I, once again, hey, you know, like who doesn't like the light bulb? Like we all like the light bulb, right? But once again, I didn't have a particular affinity for him and his body of work. I wasn't that familiar with anything other than the story we might have learned about who in, invented the light bulb. Uh, so I wasn't, um, I wasn't necessarily drawn to let me chat it up with Thomas Edison. And that alone was, I'd learned to let that be powerfully validating for me. That if it wasn't a soul that I had been completely enamored with or fascinated by their body of work, or I had a limited understanding of what their body of work had been. That was very validating to me because it helped me to see that these are not choices that I would have made. These are not the souls I would have picked up that I, out of curiosity, would have been wanting to talk with. So for those of you who have your books out, and I don't know if the um, original edition, if the pages are the same, so I'll try to go by dates. But let's take a peek at that very first time that he popped up. And the passage was on June 16th, 2005. Um, and where, when we look back on it, where there is evidence that he had a voice in this, is the last paragraph of that particular passage, that day's passage, oh, before I took a break. There's a passage on page 69 if you have this copy of the book. And it's, it's on, again, like I said, it's on June 16th, and it's be right before the break that was taken at 10.50 a.m. I don't know why I decided to tell you when I took my breaks, but I certainly did that, just so you know. Um, Live without electricity for a week, and you will quickly discover your dependence on this scientific discovery. Be a purist. Do not limit your band to just electric power, but on any source of power that emerged as a product of electricity. That means no batteries. What time is it? You own a wind-up analog, analog timepiece. What's, what's for breakfast? No toast, no waffles, unless you have a hand-held cast iron stovetop um, oh, stovetop that you will flip over your gas, non-electrically ignited stove. And your orange juice is in the cellar, a lovely lukewarm, lovely lukewarm glass, just the way you like it. So it, what, what he was doing here was, I could feel it, he was giving homage to, that's page 71 in the original, thank you, Jeannie. He was giving homage to us understanding the value of what we perceive as being progress. But it also was giving homage to the idea that um, we have sometimes become so complicated in, in what we do to make life supposedly easier or better that the ways we are complicating our lives are actually making it more difficult for us to get to the core of our own eternal wisdom, for us to be able to quiet our minds, for us to be able to know that we have the answers within us. So it's funny how progress is in some ways inversely proportional to our own individual spiritual development. Because the more stuff we have and the fewer work-oriented tasks we do when we give them up to machines to get them done for us, the more we fill that space with things that didn't used to exist. And, and when you complicate your life by filling it up with things that we're making up as we go along, there are fewer Zen moments unless you find them. You're not chopping your wood anymore because we don't need to. You know, we're heated through fuel. We have in-house systems of bringing heat to every room. We're not working on 
keeping the fires burning. We're not kneading bread. We're not um, rubbing our, our clothes on rocks or in a, in a tub of boiled water to clean them. But even though those tasks were tedious and they were necessary for our survival, what they did was they provided Zen moments for us. They provided us in living with the emptiness that allows us to stay connected to our own eternal wisdom. So part of why Edison decided to, and this is not in the book, so this is me connecting with him now, but part of the reason why he decided that he wanted to be a guest author for that passage, or at least participated in some way, was to show us that there's value in staying connected to having a quiet mind, but also to questioning what's going on around us. You know, just the simple process of thinking about what life would be like without electricity down to the orange juice that you have stored in your cellar so it's a little on the cooler side. Um, when you scale down and you scale back, you do have the freedom to connect with non-physical sources or your higher self or eternal wisdom. Um, and he came in to try to help us or encourage us as Ayn had already started in the book to encourage us to become independent in our thinking, to not get so um, reckless in our use of machinery that's supposed to be simplifying life that we're using the rest of our time to spin wheels for things that are not necessarily going to bring long-term happiness or unity for ourselves or others, or enlightenment, or help us heal from our past pains. Uh, but to understand that uh, it is important to question, question, question what the world is like around you and to choose independently what you want to participate in and that which it is you reject. Um, it's interesting, Nellie, because you probably in your question or your comment in just anticipated what I was going to say. The reason that this came up as a possibility to have a conversation of looking at the answers in depth and bringing in the souls that channeled this through me was exactly because of our period of isolation. Our period of isolation has brought so many people around the globe to, to simplify you know, once they're able to manage their own personal views of what this virus means to them emotionally or spiritually or economically or socially or physically, once they can get to a point where they can reconcile their own relationship with that, it has given us an opportunity to choose more. What do I want to do? Do I want to bake? Do I want to cook? Do I want to color? Do I want to play with my spirograph? Do I want to garden? Do I want to plant from seeds? Do I want to um, sing? Do I want to draw? Do I want to take up an instrument? All of a sudden, with so, so many fewer opportunities with the running around that we typically will do, with fewer opportunities, a little less running around, we got to make more choices. And a lot of those choices have for a lot of people, and I'm guessing more people who are online with us than might be typical outside of this room, but we've made choices to honor the simple. We've made choices to um, put in action things that can perhaps help us to remain in a more simplified manner in the future moving forward. We've prioritized, we've clean things out. Although I will say, I don't know how long we're into this, but for some reason my windows still are not clean. I don't know why that is. We're home for how many months and my windows still are not clean. I don't know how that happens, but they're not. But, you know, a lot of us have cleaned things out, cleaned out garages and attics and um, memory boxes and, um, you know, places where we haven't been. It's, it's, interesting to clean but the metaphor behind it is far more powerful the metaphor behind it and getting rid of that which it is that no longer serves us is allowing us also to not only simplify but to choose actively what it is we want to move forward with so this is coinciding with our wrapping up of our stay at home period because 
we also want to take the examples of the passages in the book and think even more about how we can apply them to our own lives. And never a better time to have the canvas clear of what expectations we have of ourselves and others have had of us and to re-emerge into um, the world or our, our workplace or whatever you know, balls we have up in the air in, in the life that we think we left behind. But to activate our ability to choose that which we return to and that which we don't return to, to re-emerge through choice. And so um, so much of this book and the souls that came through to channel this for us, they were very um, eager to help us to remember to be independent in our thinking. Yeah, a lot of times, oh, two, oh, that's so funny, 20, 22 minutes, that's right. Christina, I never saw that. That's so funny. Twenty, Yeah, 22 minutes when Pat stopped talking to me and 2-2 two, two was the first day that I channeled and I'm going to get to your other part. Um, but a lot of people mistake and they think independent thinking means rebellion. And it doesn't. That's not what it means. Independent thinking means that you have the, the curiosity and the self-love and the faith to understand that there are ways to make choices about your own life and your own thoughts and your own patterns that could bring you more harmony and therefore by a byproduct of your harmony, bring more harmony to others simply by not necessarily following the crowd, but thinking about what you choose, not rejecting what other people do, but at least if you participate in what others think or do, do so with an open mind, do so consciously, do so knowing that you are actively choosing to participate or to listen or to be a part of it. So independent thinking is not about rejection. It's not about rebellion. It's about being awake. It's about being the, the most um, respected authority in your own life. Being your own most respected authority. Because honestly, who knows better than you? Who knows better how something makes you feel? Who knows better what your dreams are? Who knows better what your passions are? Who knows better what bores you or excites you? The only person that's ever going to know that is you more than anyone. So you don't want to supplant all of those energies inside you in the essence of your being with the body of any other person's purpose or anyone else's expectations or anyone else's rules. If you follow a rule, you follow it because you think it's wise or you follow it because it's something that resisting the consequence doesn't, doesn't have the benefit that resisting that rule would have. But you also make sure that you're mindful of independently thinking about rules that are placed on you and limitations that are placed on you. You know, what, what is the purpose of your life? What is the purpose of all of our lives? And so that is, it is very interesting that in 15 years, and it, it, it did coincide with virtually the 15th year anniversary of me channeling this, that it is coinciding with such an amazing, unexpected, almost more miraculous period of time where we are able to be more contemplative, more um, perhaps quiet, more reflective. I'm sure that many of you have had insights into yourself or your journey or your choices and have decided that there are some things that you participated in that don't necessarily serve you for the future. And maybe there are things that have been alluring to you that you haven't actively pursued and you've decided that you do want to pursue it more when, when we reemerge. Um, raise your hand if you have had a change in heart about how you're going to live your life when we reemerge. Plenty of us have, no matter what it is. And part of independent thinking is tapping into the belief and the knowledge and the wisdom that you can, that you can change anything. If, if people are telling you that something cannot be done, use it as fuel to say, I'll show you, you know, one thing is that 
in the period from 9-11, 2001 till I released this book in January of 2007, that's a long time. I can count on one hand the number of people that I told about the journey. And I, I don't know that I understood why I was so selective about it. I think primarily the story I told myself was I didn't want anyone thinking I was nuts. Because to me, this was nuts unless I'd lived it. But I, I told myself the story that, um, that I didn't want anyone thinking I was crazy until I was ready to come out with this with as much validity as I could and much, much validation. But the truth is, um, people are not always going to be your supporters. Uh, we all have you know, something that comes up from our history. And even the most loving people might not want to see your success for their own fear. So the primary reason probably I resisted sharing was because I didn't want input. I didn't want feedback. I didn't want people getting me off my game. I didn't want to lose the trust in the process. I didn't want to lose my passion by listening to people who might be naysayers or have a lot of doubt or might want to shoot me down or might not want me to have that path because they preferred the path that I was on and the way that it may have influenced or interacted with their life. And so here we're kind of like, I kind of tucked in for that period, especially while channeling, but here we all have tucked in for a period. This gives us all the opportunity to liberate ourselves from the things that are no longer serving us. And I, you know, um, there is someone on the call where uh, before um, this virus hit, one of the things that I had said when we would speak and I, I would communicate with her guides for her. One of the, I want to see if I could see her face, but I'm not going to say her name, but I would say, and she knows this darn well is she was making a change and, and her guides kept saying over and over and over again, do not do anything after the change that you don't want to continue for the rest of your life every day. Right. So sometimes when we make a change, we get excited about stuff and people get excited about being near us or seeing us or how we're around. But if you do something, you better expect to keep doing it because the people around you are going to expect you to keep doing that. And I still don't see her face. Let me find her face there. Um, okay. Right. Didn't you hear that story? Just all of you nod. Yes. You heard that story. And, and it turned out to be that Corona hit the change at exactly the same time. So she could not start anything that she didn't want to continue for the rest of her life. And this is coinciding with all of us. When we reemerge, don't do anything you don't want to continue. <clears throat> I'm not saying quit your job or anything like that. Of course, you have to make a plan. But if your plan is to shift careers then the one thing you might not want to do because you're going to have to do it forever is um, say, yes, I love my job. Yes, I could see where it'll be in five years. Oh, yes, I'll be here. In oh, yes, I'm going to retire with it. Now you're already kind of giving an expectation to others that on some weird way energetically, they're going to make you accountable for. But you could come out and say, if anything, Corona has helped me revive my passionate dream about becoming a such and such or doing this. So don't commit to re-emerging in anything that you don't want to continue. I know I'm exaggerating when I say for the rest of your life, but if you don't want to continue, don't commit to be connected to it at the same level that you were before this. This is the same process. Emerge consciously. Emerge consciously. Stay awake when you emerge, okay? Stay awake. It's very easy to fall into old habits, but stay connected. Stay connected. Stay connected. Um, did any, I'm sure a lot of you have, but did you ever lose something that meant a lot to you and you know, you, you, and then when you found it, you kind of like, uh, you were bargaining. If, if I find it, I promise I'll, I'll never do this again. I'll never do this again. Well, you find the thing and you're like, yeah, oh, life is good again. This feels fantastic. I feel wonderful. And then 17 minutes later, you're doing the thing that you bargained that you said you would never do to get that thing back. So it's very easy to fall into patterns, but you want to be awake. 
when we come at, back out. You want to be awake when you come back out. Okay? All right. So I'm going to go to um, one more soul for tonight um, and see what other soul wants to come in. And I also want to mention uh, something that I had found in my manuscript, which I found fascinating, is that there was another soul. Um, there were quite a few souls I communicated with that never wrote a passage, but they would come in and communicate with me during my warm-up period. And although I remember communicating with them in those early years, or I've communicated with them here or there over the last 15 years, I really did not remember them coming in and literally writing with me while I was channeling this manuscript. So I will be telling you some of those as well. And before I turn to one other soul who channeled something with me, um, I want to mention, uh, here's one of the mini miracles, and it's just one piece of evidence to give validation to this whole experience. But one thing really significant is the first time I connected to non-physical souls in a way that I was conversant, meaning I wasn't just getting hit by lightning and seeing a tsunami or having my, having my consciousness be at the World Trade Center on 9-11 or all the other places that my consciousness was. But the first time I was able to connect in a knowing way with another soul um, without a body was on um, February 2nd, 2005. The first thing that I found really interesting about it in hindsight is the, it, it was Groundhog Day. Oh, Nellie, it, it, it adds up to 11. I never noticed that. That's funny. 2 to 2005 is 11. Um, that's interesting. And 11 is intuition. Yeah. It's funny. Okay. So, um, it's groundhog day, you know, uh, two, two is groundhog day. And one thing that was really fascinating, I didn't realize it until years later, but every, everyone's probably seen that Bill Murray movie groundhog day where you wake up and the day begins over and over and over and over again. My, 2005 and my 2006 were groundhog days. When I was connected, I was on and I was happy and I was flowing and I was the essence of my being. When I was disconnected, I was miserable. I was in pain. I was scared. I was fear-based. I was misinterpreting interactions with people. I was misinterpreting my past. I was misinterpreting my present. So I lived in this um, black, white, black, white, black, white. And, and, and I, when I was explaining the 22 minutes to you, I, I am telling you, it was that thorough. When I was on, I was happy. When I was off, I was miserable. I was less happy after the process started because I now had a frame of reference for how high I could be when I was connected to the non-physical. Without that previous frame of reference in my life, my level of misery capped at a certain level. But once I went higher into higher highs during that period, my lows went lower as well, which is actually quite fascinating considering I had a very difficult childhood and and in some cases, you know, had more struggles than I would want any, anyone to have. So even if going through that childhood, the lows that I experienced weren't as low as the lows that I felt when I couldn't talk to guides or I couldn't sense them or I couldn't feel them or I didn't believe in them or I didn't believe them. What it does is it shows you and showed me the power of how important it is that we understand we are eternal and that we understand we are not alone and that we understand we are connected because it wasn't until I lost that feeling that I experienced depths of pain that I never had before. And I share that because I don't think anyone need go to that place where I was on my groundhog mornings when the alarm went off because you have so much more information and so much more experience and so much more wisdom 
individually and collectively on this planet than we did 15 years ago. So you're not at the starting point I was at in 2005. Nobody is. No one needs suffer. When I, I know it's all our imagination, it's all an illusion, but no one need go through that. We know too much now. We're here for each other. The second fascinating thing about the date, um, let me, I want to see someone else's face on this for a second, and I'm sure she knows who it is. Let me see if I can find her. Uh, there she is. Sue, look up. There she is. Okay. Um, all right. So now here it is. Pretty heady, heady shit here. I am channeling Ayn Rand, right? That's, that's a lot to deal with, okay? Uh, that's, that's heady. So I'm adjusting and I'm adjusting and I'm, I'm getting tons of physical evidence. I was sent on a big scavenger hunt. I got a miracle at the end of the scavenger hunt. But seven years later, seven years later, Miss Sue comes to me and she says, uh, I still got to see her face. Wave to everybody, Sue. She said, did you know that February 2nd, 2005 was the 100th birthday of Ayn Rand? And I'm like, no effing way. You've got to be kidding me. The 100th birthday? No, I didn't even know when her birthday was. I certainly didn't know it was 2-2. I mean, how ignorant am I? I'm doing all this stuff. Google's already a thing. Never once did I look up Ayn Rand on that Google thing, okay? Never once. I went directly to her and I let her tell me whatever she wanted to tell me. But the very first time I ever connected with her, you can't make this shit up, was on her 100th birthday of the incarnation of the Ayn Rand character. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? Yeah, pretty cool. But thank you, Sue. I was so glad that you discovered that and was able to put the pieces together. And, and it was funny, too, because when she told me, she was just saying it as though, you know, she found out something I clearly knew for all these years. And I'm like, what? You're kidding me. <laughs> If I had only had that knowledge for that other seven years, maybe I would have had a few less of those groundhog days. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So one thing that um, I wanted to do is I, we already communicated with what Thomas Edison wanted to add to his passage that he included in this book. So I do want to add if there's any other soul for tonight that wants to add to his or her passage um, from what they communicated in this book. And I'm sure for those of you who haven't done so yet, you're probably going to go to the acknowledgement page and try to decipher all of the initials. So I'm going to let you off the hook and tell you that there's a couple you'll never figure out. So you don't spend any unnecessary scrambling energy to get it done. <clears throat> um, you will not unscramble JG. Uh, because he was only personally known to me. Uh, you will, you do know who Pat is now. I wrote out her full name and she is in there. You know who she is. You don't have to think any farther about that. Wexel, you will not unscramble. That's a soul that never had a physical life with us that I have communicated with at length. And um, Weiss also is a soul that hasn't had a physical life. So you're not going to be able to find an incarnation of him. He did... Uh, solely channel the book Money Wisdom um, through me. 100% of Money Wisdom was from this soul known as Weiss, okay? Um, Seth, I didn't use initials because Seth, everybody knows who Seth is, although I didn't at the time, but we all know who Seth is. And the rest, um, you may be able to figure them out. I tried to make it a little bit easier for you there by taking out the, the ones that weren't possible. Um, all right, so we, we heard from um, Thomas Edison. Now, um, let's see. I know who really wants to come in and is in, but his story is going to take us longer than three minutes. So we're going to, uh, we're going to avoid that. Um, all right, I know who it is. All right, so 
And one of the souls that came in and out of this book a lot, but more had um, more time in the beginning warm up periods with me um, was uh, George Harrison. And what's really interesting about that is that the first time that I communicated with him, it was during my, my stubborn disconnect from channeling the answers. It was in January of 2006. I'm um, part of the story when I tell it from September of 2005 through when I, you know, reconnected with channeling the book in July of 2006. Um, part of the story was how I came about communicating with George Harrison. And that was interwoven um, with the entirety of that year of um, my own enlightenment advancement of many, many of miracles that had happened during the period where I was able to get evidence beyond a shadow of a doubt that helped me to pursue with unlimited passion moving forward with being connected to souls that don't have physical bodies. Um, but what I didn't realize uh, um, until there was hindsight is that even while I was channeling through all of 2005, those months, I wasn't even aware that George Harrison was just kind of, you know, omnipresent somewhere. Um, I hadn't communicated directly with him, but I didn't recognize that there are tons and tons and tons of souls that uh, there's no limitation in time. There's no limitation in, um, in space or focus. There's, th those things don't exist in the energy realm. So we can focus on, I can communicate with Jeannie, I can communicate with, with Jennifer, I can communicate with Janet and Joanne and the other Jennifer and Sifa and Lori and Alexis. I can communicate as a soul without a body with all of you simultaneously without any limitation. So a soul without a body can be connecting to, um, guiding, an unlimited number of people. And the reason I'm telling you this is because it will help you to recognize that you're not limited to a small number of resources to tap into for your own life. And you're not bothering any soul in the non-physical by asking for guidance or participation. You're never bothering a soul because they don't have any limitations and things aren't in boxes and things aren't categorical and there's no um, hierarchy of better or worse. You're not, not enough. Um, we go through life seeing ourselves as small. You're not small. In the eyes of the souls in the energy realm, you're infinite, you're complete and you're whole. So if you feel like chatting it up when we hang up tonight and you feel like chatting it up with Thomas Edison, by all means, go ahead. Thomas Edison is not better than you. Thomas Edison had a different vibrational energy that allowed him to orchestrate the players and the pieces and the circumstances during his earthly life that allowed him to advance technology and progress in a um, irreversible way. But it doesn't mean that he's better than you. No one is better than you. And, and so let's also use these three classes that we have together for you to reconnect to the powerful eternal being that you are. And even though I introduced the idea that, you know, George Harrison is with us tonight and, and definitely with me so often, rather than um, me introducing who another author and which passage it was in this book, we'll go through them more next time. Um, what I will do instead is in listening to Thomas Edison is I'm, I'm going to give you a homework assignment and it's going to come directly from him. Please don't share this outside the class because we need to keep our friends and loved ones thinking that we're okay. <laughs> but <laughs> um, your homework assignment until we meet again is to um, just kind of suspend doubt and feel on some level, some place, some way, some day, some time, just feel that he's watching over you, that Thomas Edison is literally and physically and directly connecting with you. 
whether it's through a sign, a whisper, a dream, a thought, an action, a turn of the cheek where you look at something that you hadn't um, looked at otherwise, whether it's a pop of a weird coincidence, whether it's a pop of a light bulb, in some way, um, use the next couple of weeks to experience the fact that because you have turned your focus to the soul that had formerly been known as Thomas Edison, the soul that was formerly known as Thomas Edison is turning his focus to you. Okay. Um, what we can do next time we come back is, you know, I'll ask you, you can type some things in the chat room. Um, if you would like, you can send me your experiences in the interim, how you have knowingly, um, what's my email? It's at, that's an at. Yeah, that's an at. Um, Um, it, whatever experience you have, you can send it to me. And if I have a compilation of different stories of how people noticed him or saw him or sensed him or felt connected or in any way, um, share your story with me. And whatever I do have, I won't put your names in there, but I will um, compile them and send them to whatever email addresses you have registered tonight um, through. Because uh, one of the things that's very cool about doing a group event is that we get to share different perspectives with people who are like-minded and it expands and broadens our own view of how we connect and how we interpret and process our experiences in our human journey. So simply by sharing how you have known over the next two weeks, the presence of Thomas Edison in your day-to-day -day experiences, we get to... Um, broaden our own ideas of how that might be possible in our lives, okay? And I think that would be really fun for us to, to share. Um, and we, you know, uh, okay, Debbie, you're asking, uh, do we ask him to connect with us first? It, we do tend to formalize things when we're communicating with the non-physical because we've been taught to do that, you know, um, do, you know, lighting a candle and hopping three times and facing the wind on the south. And then you got to have your maracas out that keep off the, the guides of storms or whatever. But that's really actually not necessary. In less than a heartbeat, a soul that you are thinking of is completely aware of why you're thinking of them and is consciously connecting with you. Okay? There is no barrier. So yes, you can ask him to connect with you but that's for your sake, not his sake, okay? You can't even address a two, a one-syllable word in your head when you're about to think of a soul without them being there before you can complete the syllable in your own head. That's how instantaneous their connection with us is. So your ping is, top. that was supposed to be Thomas Edison, top. he's there, just get the top. he's there. He's there. He's ready. He's ready. Okay. So even just being on this call tonight and getting the homework assignment, he's available to you for your peace of mind and your clarity and to attune yourself, feel free to say, Hey, Tommy, I'm ready. You there? Come on. Let me know. Okay. Uh, yes, it would be cool to all connect at the same time. That would be really funny if we, even if a few people was like, Oh, it was, you know, 8-12 on Thursday. Hey, you know what? Good point. If you do send me your connection, do just write the dates and times. Out of curiosity, it'd be kind of fun to experiment around. And I didn't expect at all that uh, good old Tommy was going to say, let me talk to all of you. No, I wasn't anticipating that at all. Uh, so this is you know, come as you are and go as we go, and we'll just see and continue to see how it unfolds. His friends call him Alpha. Is that true? I believe you. Is that a fact, Joe? Let's wait for him to answer. His friends call him Alpha. All right, I'll assume he's correct. I don't know why that just, oh no, it's just a joke. You're a pain in the neck. Get off my call. I'm calling him Alpha from now on. Oh, that's his middle name. <laughs> oh, man. 
Oh man, that was good. All right, so let's all call in Alva and, uh, and, and jot down the date and, and the time. And if you're on the other coast, tell us that you're on Pacific time and tell us if you're on Eastern time or whatever time you're on too. Uh, all right, it was wonderful to see all of you. I'm sorry I kept you a little over. You can blame Alva for that. It wasn't my fault. And I will happily see you when we meet again. Good night, everybody.